After much delay, it's time to cover Nintendo Power issue 107 for April of 1998. Not a lot of games this issue, at least not the ones we've already covered, but in any case, let's begin. Our cover game this issue is Kobe Bryant's NBA courtside, heralding the impending start of the Lakers dynasty, supplanting the Bulls, and with this, the waning of Jordan's star. In the letters column, we got a lot of letters debating the merits of quote-unquote 2.5D games, like, for example, Mischief Makers and uh, Yoshi's Story on the N64. In the power charts, we have a new entrant on the Game Boy charts with James Bond 007. As is frequently the case, we are starting off with the cover game, we, uh, NBA's courtside featuring Kobe Bryant. We have a discussion of the uh, presentation of the game and the animations along with gameplay modes and also team rosters for most of the teams with Michael Jordan listed on the Bulls as roster player because Jordan left the Players Association and was requesting a larger sum of money distinct to what the rest of the roster was getting and the developers decided not to pay up. Kobe Bryant's NBA Courtside is a solid basketball game with a couple of weird little control issues. For example, it's odd how sometimes I have no problems passing to another player who is way the heck down court, out of the line of sight of the camera, and other times when I try to pass to a player in a similar situation, I'll just throw the ball to thin air and out of bounds. Uh, sometimes I have real difficulty switching players to the one nearest the ball. Other times the game will just casually flick over to the nearest player so I can handle defense. I did eventually figure out like how to do this more consistently with the right button inputs after rereading the manual after I recorded the gameplay footage, but still a hassle. Um, so it's mapped to the C buttons, which puts your thumb out of alignment of the buttons that you use for defense, that sort of thing. It's also not entirely intuitive to tell what is the best position and movement for a dunk for what player. Going from the notes in the manual and in the article, it's like you're supposed to know based on the player that you're controlling, which is great for when you're playing, when you are playing the game contemporaneously with the game's release and you're playing your team or a team that you are very much a fan of or familiar with, like the Bulls or the Lakers, but it's not as helpful as say 16 years down the road, you're trying to remember how Rashid Wallace approaches the, the hoop in order to do a dunk. That said, I did enjoy this game though, and I think it is an excellent addition to the N64 sports library. In this and FIFA 98, we've got a couple of really solid sports games that are really worth picking up. Brian Grant for two. Next up is a Preview of Deadly Arts, which is a Konami fighting game that touts a create a fighter mode. I mean, this is a, a preview. I want to hold off on doing a full review of the game for later. Nintendo's first party Major League Baseball series has come to the N64, with Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. We are still in preview territory as the game's rosters haven't even been finalized, so the focus in this coverage is on the fundamentals, you know, batting, pitching, fielding. This includes discussion of field designs as well, because if you've been a fan of baseball for any period of time, you know that baseball stadiums vary, in some cases very considerably. This leads into discussions of outfield dimensions and stuff like outfield walls. Again, if you know anything about baseball, you probably know about the big green monster. Again, this is a preview, so I'm gonna hold off on a proper review of the game until later when we get close to the game's actual release. In advance of the N64 release of NFL Blitz, we get a preview of the arcade version so you know what to expect when you're playing the N64 version. I'm not really doing arcade coverage here, so again, holding off. In the classified information column, we get a bunch of different graphical mods available through codes for FIFA 98. Stepping briefly into the Game Boy coverage, we have a preview of the Game Boy camera and printer. This is one of those things where I'd love to be able to review this, but I don't have a Game Boy camera and I also don't have a Game Boy printer. So it's a little tricky for me to actually cover that. Ah, well. Back to the game coverage. We have continuation of the coverage from previous issue of Quake 
for the N64 with more level strategies and maps. We also get more love expert level strategies for 1080 snowboarding. Also, Nintendo is putting out their own greatest hits line to complete with PlayStation's one for games that have sold over a million copies. And we have a whole slew of strategies for the inaugural titles of this line. This includes Mario Kart 64, Super Mario 64, Cruisin' USA, Turok, Star Fox 64, Wave Race 64, and Shadows of the Empire. So lots of the um, launch lineup at this point. We have more coverage of Wet Tricks and its game mechanics, which again, it's a game I've already reviewed, and they kind of covered the game mechanics actually pretty well when we were looking at the preview earlier. One more preview here. Uh, we have Iggy's Rocking Balls, a downhill racing game. It looks like it's taking inspiration from Marble Madness, but instead of using the harder, less bouncy you know, marbles, they're using bouncy balls with additional potential physics issues. However, this game is not out until the summer. So again, no full coverage review will have to wait. Next is Virtual Chess 64. It's an N64 chess game. That's pretty much it. Virtual Chess 64 is okay. AI is fairly challenging with a wide range of difficulty options. And if you play the game in 3D mode, you get some battle chess style combat animations to spice up the game. Though you also don't get to pick the models that are used for these combat animations. So the only version of the queen that you get is the stereotypical fat lady opera singer Viking thing. Um, that, that whole stereotype. And also controlling the camera, like actually controlling it is a pain in the butt when it turns to adjusting the angles for a better view of the board. So I just found myself switching to 2D mode sort of a better view and that gets rid of the um, battle chess animation. So yeah, I also would have preferred if we had a, a graphic highlighting legal move options for each selected piece or just what your selected piece is. I know how the pieces move in chess, um, but someone who's new wouldn't and that would certainly be something that would help be helpful. And sometimes it's just nice having a reminder, particularly with pieces like, for example, the knight. So you have an idea, okay, these are the places that I'm threatening. And these are the pieces that I have protected. So I, as a reminder, okay, I should not move or be careful how I move this piece. So it maintains protecting a pawn or something else that is more useful to me. Again, it's fine. Um, but there are so many better ways to play chess on the computer these days, some of which have those quality of life features that honestly, you're better off playing something else. Like, or there's even chess games you can play on your phone. Um, you have significantly better options to get your chess fix. In classified information, we get a whole bunch of tips for GoldenEye 007. We are starting off our Game Boy coverage with Legend of the Mystical Ninja on the Game Boy. That's right, Goemon is on the go. We have maps for some of the areas for the first four chapters. When it comes to Game Boy games, there are two play environments that the platform really thrives in. The short session waiting room game, like your Tetris, or the long session road trip and commute game. Now, if you're going for the latter concept, you still need to be able to accommodate for the former whether it's because you need to suspend your game because you're transferring between buses and trains, or because you're stopping at a rest stop or restaurant to stretch your legs, use the bathroom, maybe eat something. Adapting Legend of the Mystical Ninja to the Game Boy definitely runs into those difficulties, but it doesn't handle them well. The game only gives you one life over the course of the game. Now, presumably there are options to acquire additional lives over the course of play, but I didn't reach any of those. The Also, the expiration in using shopkeepers and Cash picked up from enemies during like the main overworld area to prepare for the bigger sort of dungeon or platforming sections is gone. It makes the game very much a mess. For a game that on every other platforms achieved the sort of core conceit of Legend of the Mystical Ninja, combining like 
Legend of Zelda top-down exploration gameplay and then either platforming or similar dungeon crawling, like continuing with that idiom, um, the Game Boy version just stumbles and falls on its face spectacularly. It's really a bummer. Our next game title is Legend of the River King, a fishing game, or fishing RPG rather, on the Game Boy. We have some maps of the early areas with notes on what you can catch where and what eats what. Legend of the River King is a interesting fishing RPG combining the, well, the RPG concept with the, you know, fishing, slow, patient gameplay. However, I have a big gripe with it. While the Game Boy had a very good sound chip and could do some really solid music, this game is also very, very dependent on audio cues in order to tell if you've got a nibble on the line. Which is a problem where if you're in environments where you can't have the Game Boy sound on, or you can't hear the system well with the kind of cheap headphones lots of people had in the late 90s when this game and this issue Nintendo Power came out. I mean, that's the thing with portable gaming. As much as I like hearing the music and incantations from Fate Grand Order, a large portion of the time I'm playing it with the sound off because I am in a waiting room here waiting to hear my name called so I can't have earbuds in or I'm on a bus and I'm partially paying attention or needing to pay attention somewhat to announcements of upcoming stops. So if I'm look, not looking at the sign, I need to be able to hear the announcement. So either of those aren't gonna work well here. Last up, this issue is Ring Rage on the Game Boy, which looks like a UWFI hybrid shoot game, but without the license. It's not, but from the description, it feels like it is. And the article has notes on the fighters. The problem with fighting games on the Game Boy is you don't have the same level of graphical fidelity and detail that you have on other platforms. If you make a more realistic character sprite, you end up having to sacrifice a considerable amount of visual distinctiveness. That's why I think the Battle of the Toshinden Game Boy game worked for me. Is that, that game used super deformed sprites and made them big and exaggerated and caricatured to fit with what shows up on the Game Boy screen compared to trying to make the characters reflect the versions that they have in the actual uh, full version of the game on arcades and in consoles where a lot of that distinctness would be lost. And thus, that's why this one doesn't work for me. For comparison purposes, I looked up the original Ring Rage game, an arcade fighting game made by Taito with digitized actors, and the game really leans into the bright, colorful, colorful style of 80s and 90s pro wrestling that you see in games like Saturday Night Slam Masters, people with characters who, while not based on wrestlers from a particular promotion, do do the whole thing of being clearly inspired by real wrestlers. For example, um, one of the wrestlers has the does the whole Abdullah the Butcher uh, stabbing the, a fork into the forehead spot. And a lot of that is lost here because of how the graphics look and them trying to make characters look more realistic and with it losing all that visual distinctiveness. No also rans in the now playing column this issue and wrapping things up in pack watch, Natsume has an upcoming fighting game for the N64. My pick of the issue is Kobe Bryant's NBA courtside. Slowly but surely, the N64 is building up an assortment of at least one really good sports game for each of the major sports for the U.S. Um, we've had FIFA 98, and now we've got Kobe Bryant's NBA courtside covering, covering all the bases for, if you'll forgive the expression, for, um, well, soccer and baseball. Now we're just waiting on up north, or soccer and basketball, but now and now we're waiting on a, ba on a baseball game. We have a Ken Griffey Jr. game coming up for the N64 that may get what we're looking for. And also, as far as the cost of the game itself goes, thankfully, this is a, this is a situation where Kobe's passing hasn't jacked up the cost of the game the same way that it, did, that it did for, for example, the way that the values of all of Michael Jackson's albums kicked up after his passing. Perhaps help with the fact that Kobe was in a lot of sports games before he passed. So, in any case, this game is a 
pretty decent option if you're looking to say, hey, what's the best sports games to pick up for the N64? NBA Courtside is a good one to go with. And next time, again, Ken Griffey Jr. Baseball on the N64 and Pokemon coverage. We'll get to that next issue, next episode. For two. Damon Stoudemire makes the basket. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.